The other thing that really surprised me in analyzing the stats for millennials was uh, drug overdoses and suicides and what some people call deaths of despair went up between Gen Xers and millennials during adulthood. Dr. Twangy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We're going to talk about your work. I've read two of your books. I have iGen here, and then I have Generations that I just got finished reading. I'm really excited to talk about Generations. I thought iGen was a great book. I really loved how you have a very non-judgmental tone when you're talking about different generations, because a lot of people want to look at dinner, different ger- generations from a judgmental perspective. So I really appreciated that. Um, I think three things that kind of stood out to me as themes of generations is technology being the primary driver of uh, generational differences. Individualism versus collectivism is a big concept in your book. And then uh, another thing I picked up on was the internal versus external locus of control, which wasn't throughout the entire book, but I think is a pretty big theme in it. Um, feel free to share anything you want additional, and then we'll just kind of dive in from there. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the technology theory of generations is a great place to start because you know a lot of people are familiar with kind of the traditional model of generations is being focused on major events. So things like economic cycles, wars, pandemics, and with the idea that each generation experiences events at certain ages, and that's what makes them who they are. But I, even though I think that the events have an impact, it really often isn't that long term. It doesn't impact people's day to day lives that much because you think about what makes it different. Why is it different to live now compared to 200 years ago, or 100 years ago, or 50 years ago, or even 20 years ago? The answer to that is clearly technology. And not just computers and smartphones, but all types of technology, faster transportation and communication, washing machines, better medical care. All of these things have changed how we live our day-to-day lives. And that's why I focus on that so much in the book, that really cultural change is driven by the changes in technology. When people look at generations... I've heard some people kind of give you pushback on the idea of generations. And one of the ways that I've looked at it, I'm conceptualizing it, and I'd love for you to give me feedback on this, is a bell curve, actually a 3D bell curve, because you're looking at the bell curve versus time, because if you're born in the middle of a generation, it's not that everything will resonate with you, so that's the other dimension. But the middle of the generation is more likely to resonate with a higher percentage of things that align with that generation. And as you go on the outskirts of that time bell curve, then you're probably going to have a little bit more overlap with the other generations. Am I correct in that? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's certainly one thing that, you know, we have to acknowledge is that those cutoffs between generations, those lines are fuzzy, not sharp. And yeah. that's that's one of the things you're getting to. And, you know, what I think is interesting about some of the pushback in this area is I really think it's around details because I, pretty much everybody agrees that it's different to live now versus previous decades and centuries. We're all pretty much on the same page with that. Um, we all agree that, say, for example, uh, being a young person now, so growing up now is very different from what previous generations experienced in many ways. So what we often debate is, should we bin people into categories based on birth year? And where should those birth year cutoffs be? And what should the labels be? And yeah, we can debate those. But I do think those are details in the grand scheme of things. And one aspect of that is, yeah, can you really put everybody into one group of people born in you know a 15 to 20 year period and say they're all going to be the same? Well, of course, they're not all going to be the same. They're going to differ based on their specific birth year. They're also going to differ based on all kinds of other demographic variables. And what I think is interesting about some of the criticisms in this area is they, they're often criticisms that apply to any study of groups, 
whether that's yeah. people based on age or region of the country where they grew up or race and ethnicity or social class. Um, people say, well, you know, how can you overgeneralize? Well, that's what we do all the time. Anytime yeah. we look at group differences and generations are no different. Yeah. I mean, when you're looking at any large group or comparison of groups, you're looking at averages exactly. and, and stereotypes sometimes, but averages are never going to be fitting of every person in, in any group. Of so course. It just makes sense. So I want to just quickly go over the time periods for the generations. So, because it does change, some people define the generations with slightly different years, because as you yes. point out in the book, it is arbitrary to some degree. Yep. So Silence, born 1925 to 45. Boomers, born 1946 to 64. Generation X, born 65 to 79. Millennials, born 1980 to 1980, or 1994. Gen Z, 95 to 2012. And then Polars, 2013 to 2029. I'd imagine the Polars is a little bit up for debate over time because yeah, for we sure. might see different technological changes and stuff. Yeah, the ending date in particular, I think we don't really know yet. Um, I have a little bit of confidence in the 2012 um, being in Gen Z and 2013 in Polars, um, somewhat ironically based on a major event, which was the COVID-19 pandemic. Hmm. But that wasn't your average event. Um, yeah. It affected day-to-day -day lives for so many people. And I think you could argue it had a particular impact on the younger children. And if you were born in 2012 versus 2013, for one thing, um, you know, if you're born earlier than that, you'll probably have memories of a time before the COVID pandemic. If you're born 2013 and later, you may not. And I think there's a difference too in being in, say, kindergarten or first grade or younger when COVID hit versus second grade and higher. And that's 2012, 2013 is about where that cutoff falls. Hmm. Yeah, I'm personally a millennial. You're a, a Gen X. Mm -hmm. And I want to go through the generations a little bit. My, I'll probably focus more on Gen Z, Millennials, and Gen X because they feel more relevant to me, even though my parents are boomers. So I do have some experience with that generation and every generation, really. Um, so as far as silence, it was interesting because obviously I wasn't alive at the time. I don't have a full picture of what happened, but a lot of the social justice causes that we see today were originally started with silence. Am mm -hmm. I right there? Yeah. 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 And that's, you know, not commonly accepted. It's very common for people to think of things like the civil rights movement and the feminist movement being started by boomers, but they were not. Boomers were too young. Uh, it was the silent generation. So, you know, easy way to capture that is Martin Luther King Jr. and Ruth Bader Ginsburg were both silent generation members. And then something that it seems counterintuitive now, but being liberal and being conservative didn't necessarily align with the two political parties mm -hmm. as much as it does today. I thought that was very interesting because I think we just take it for granted that a liberal is a Democrat in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and a conservative is a Republican if mm -hmm. they align with either of the parties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there used to be liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats. That was once a thing. And if you look um, not just at politicians, but also just regular people, the link between those political ideologies and political parties has become much tighter over time. Yeah. Boomers were more politically involved than any generation that has come mm -hmm. after them. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, they managed to get the voting age changed from 21 to 18 when they were young. Uh, and they took full advantage of that. So their voter participation as young adults was higher than the generations that followed. Although, uh, it, that hit a low with Gen X, and then millennials brought it back to an extent. Gen Z is bringing it back even more. Yeah, it's interesting because in the U.S., it's looking like the two major party candidates are going to be, again, Trump and Biden, 
who are different generations. Biden is a silent mm-hmm. and Trump is a boomer, even though there's only a few years difference mm-hmm. um, between them. So what would you say are the main differences between those two generations? Well, you know, silents have a reputation for being mediators of trying to make connections between people who might have different viewpoints. And when they were younger, they did that across generations. They were often the mediators between the greatest generation who fought World War II and then the boomers who were born afterward. You had two generations with very different viewpoints on values and behaviors and worldviews and so on, and that silence kind of were in between those two. So they have played that role throughout history. So they seem to be more, you know, a little bit more willing to compromise, for example, and to try to find common ground. And um, there's, you know, arguably boomers a little bit more scorched earth, um, really inaugurated some of the political polarization that we still live with today. Something that really surprised me when I was reading the book is uh, the increase in depression and and mental health issues with boomers, Mm -hmm. specifically because having parents that are boomers, and I always felt like my parents' generation was a little bit more suck it up, depression isn't real, stuff like that. And then to read that contradicted my view or my impression Mm -hmm. of that generation. Yeah. I think that better describes the silent generation. So I think they were the ones who really came of age when uh, mental health was considered a weak, mental health issues were considered a weakness, when it wasn't talked about, when um, depression was not well understood. And that started to change with the boomers. Um, Because you think about just the, the way those issues used to be treated as, you know, a shameful secret. And boomers at least began the idea that that should not be the case. Plus, you know, of course, it's not just the stigma and how it's accepted. It's our people, more people actually suffering. And that is also the case that more boomers um, had symptoms of depression. Their suicide rate was higher. You know, no matter what measure you're looking at, um, they struggled more with mental health issues than the silence did before them, even when you take age out of the equation. Yeah, it's interesting. It must be, uh, I don't know, I, some of the silent, I mean, some of the boomers obviously aren't going to have the same impression of mental health. And maybe my experience is just the boomers I've come across have seen more akin to the silent generation mindset, I would imagine then. Yeah, certainly. There's, you know, and it's a gradual change. And it's obviously continued in that direction that you'll find even more Gen Xers and even more millennials and then even more Gen Zers who um, do not embrace the idea that we that mental health should be shameful or a secret. The word boomer, I mean, that has been around for a while, right? Like it because it's baby boomers, right? But it seems it feels weird to say it sometimes because it almost feels like there's a negative connotation to it ever since the OK Boomer mm-hmm. bad a few years back, right? Yeah. And, you know, boomers are, by definition, a very, very large generation. They've had an outside impact on everything from pop culture to politics. But I think we also have to put the, some of the beliefs about them in context that there's also a really strong perception that you know, all boomers did really well economically. Like the very common uh, narrative is that you know boomers succeeded in the economy, climbed up the ladder of success, and then pulled the ladder up after them so millennials couldn't climb it. And pretty much that whole story isn't true. Um, you look at the changes that really led to income inequality and uh, the decline of industry and things like that. Those decisions were made by the greatest generation and boomers were not the perpetrators of it. They were its first victims. Um, The other part of the story that isn't true, which we can get to in more detail later is that millennials have actually done pretty well economically, especially compared to the perception of how well they've done. Yeah, I I'm, I'm definitely have some 
thoughts on that too. <laughs> being a millennial, I have mm -hmm. the perspective of myself and friends and yeah. I, so we'll definitely talk more about that. Cool. Um, so Gen X, they're the first uh, generation with TV, but, or not with TV, but with TV basically always at your fingertips. Yeah. But yeah, it since, wasn't since the TV childhood. we have. Yeah, but it's not the TV we have today. Right. It was a piece of furniture back yeah. then. Uh, it wasn't portable, and it was on the schedule of whenever it came on. But, you know, it was there. And then being able to watch things on, uh, on tape, on a VCR, also started to come in during the Gen X, when Gen X was young. Um, so... You know, it's it's hard to call any generation the TV generation because you, you know, call call boomers that, but then yeah. you know the next generation could be called the more TV generation. So it's not just TV; it's also with Gen X. Um, what shaped that generation is coming after boomers, a very large generation with a big impact, and Gen X being smaller and not having as much of an impact. Plus. Gen X was the last generation to grow up before the internet and has kind of one foot in the physical pre-internet world and one foot in the more online post-internet world. And that is one reason why I think one thing that really distinguishes Gen X is their emphasis on being, being tough. They were the last generation yeah. to think it's a good thing to kind of get your knocks in the real world and be tough. And they take a lot of pride in that. Yeah. And um, you mentioned a more cohesive pop culture because mm -hmm. it, it wasn't now where you have YouTube, you can just look at anything you want. And it wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, uh, these endless options for TV in general with cable, yeah. how it is now and satellite TV, all of that. Yeah, so it, yeah it Gen X loves their loves their pop culture because you know we all kind of experience the same stuff more or less. Yeah. Popular movies, TV shows, and so on. It wasn't as atomized a pop culture yeah. as it is now, and I I think that that is again yeah definitely one of the distinguishing features of Gen X. Yeah, and it's interesting because as I obviously when I'm reading about when I'm reading about the Boomer generation, there's not re much resonance with me. I don't. I don't have much relation to what they experience, but as I'm reading the Gen X stuff, I'm born in 85 and some of it does resonate mm -hmm. with me, not mm -hmm. to like a heavy, heavy degree, but I think I, there's always going to be like remnants of that generation because, you know, we have siblings that might be part of a generation above us. So we, we catch some of those nearby generations to some degree. And it is. It was just interesting reading how many things that we see today started in generations that we don't typically associate with that, like uh, the consumer-oriented approach to education is something that I actually thought was more of a millennial thing. But it, I mean, you have it starting in the '90s with Gen X. That's right. Where I you mention. I ordered an A, like one teacher mm -hmm. talked about how that was mm -hmm. basically the mindset of some some kids is in I think college it was mm -hmm. where where's my A? I ordered an A. Yep. Yeah. And we see this in some of the big surveys of entering college students. They're asked things like, you know, why did you decide to go to college in the first place? And what are some important life goals? And the shifts in that area really began in that transition from uh, boomers to to Gen Xers and have continued. With when one once college students started to become millennials and, and then Gen Z, so it's things like, you know, yeah, I want to go to college to make more money as opposed to getting education and appreciation of ideas. I have a life goal of being very well off financially versus, say, a life goal of developing a meaningful philosophy of life. Mm -hmm. So boomers much more likely fall into that category of, you know, I'm here to I'm here to learn, and I you know want to want to develop that meaningful philosophy of life, then Gen Xers are like, what does that even mean? You know, let's get a good job. And that's something that has certainly continued with the generations that came after Gen X and, you know, continued its upward trajectory. Yeah. And you mentioned in the book about, there's a, 
a movie that you associate with Gen X? What is that movie? Well, there's a number of those. So I'm trying to remember which one I might have focused on. It was, uh, it had the concept of slacking. So there's, well, there is a movie called Slacker. Okay. Um, that there's, 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 there's a bunch of the kind of the quintessential Gen X movies that came out. Um, I think that one was 89, but then most of them are early 90s. So okay. Reality Bites is another one of those. I think it was Reality Bites. Yeah. That's the one I'm thinking That one of. came out in 94. It was already kind of capitalizing on the trend that had already started with more independent movies. But um, it, you know, had some cynicism to it and some, you know, uh, at the time the economy wasn't doing very well. So there was, you know, a lot of that kind of, you know, we're never going to succeed type of message. Um, it's kind of dark. And it was, it's really interesting because the early 90s had that darkness around Gen X when in just a couple of years later, the tech boom would start and a lot of Gen Xers would do really well. Mm-hmm. So the reputation of the generation swung within like two or three years from slackers who would never be successful to internet millionaires. It's like, wait, pick one. But they were both somewhat true because a lot of young adults were struggling economically in the early 90s. The idea was, oh, they'll never catch up. And then they did. Same was yeah. same, same trajectory for millennials, too. Yeah, it is interesting how the what we think about a generation can change very quickly. Mm-hmm. I mean, because you have this idea and people change over time. Like one of the things that you pointed out was Gen X appeared to be more depressed than boomers as teens. But then as they became adults, what was expected, we, I mean, people expected them to be more depressed as adults, but that didn't seem to pan out. That's right. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the stats for teen depression and I mean, where we have the, most solid data is is for for suicide. It was off the charts in the early '90s for teens, and you know I think we have to think about what that time was like. Violent crime was at an all time high. The economy wasn't doing well. You know it was kind of this you know greedy horrible time. Um, if you know you like watching older TV shows on streaming, go watch the first couple of seasons of the show ER, and it mm-hmm. captures a lot of this. And then it turned around and Gen X turned around too. Their trajectory really improved. Violent crime went down, the economy got better, and Gen X did better in terms of their mental health as well. As adults, um, their rates of depression were not that different from boomers. And in some surveys were actually even a little bit lower. I mean, would that be because of resilience, like the resilience that they had as children and being more independent do you think it's possible that might have played a role um that they were able to come back to that resilience from having an independent childhood that that may have maybe not always been the best situation when they were teenagers but to serve them better as as adults but i think it's a lot of these larger factors too of um you know what was going on in the early 90s versus later both economically and especially in terms of that crime rate. I think that made a big difference. And there's some speculation too that, you know, some that those suicide statistics are clo- they're closely tied to the the homicide statistics and what that has in common is a lot of gun violence. So that mm. may may have been part of it too. Yeah. Um one of the things that did resonate with me is the Captain Crunch and cartoons on Saturday morning. So that's mm-hmm. a tradition that carried over to millennials, at least in mm-hmm. my home, quite a bit. So yeah. it's really interesting. Um, the cynicism and what was going on with crime and everything like that probably drove some cynicism. And it, Gen X was really where we started to see more distrust in the government and mm-hmm. institutions. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I include that in the Gen X chapter, even even though the declines in trust in government, you know, go across all of the generations. But really, it was the 90s where you really started to see the decline in those things. 
And that's when Gen Xers were young adults. So I, I you know, framed it in, in that chapter. But it's something that impacts all of us and that has continued to have an impact. So there we're talking about surveys, um, both of teens and of adults, where they're asked things about you know, trust in other people but also trust in government and in medicine and in the press. And all of those just started to plummet in the 90s and have not come back since. So there's, I think some of that is rooted in consumerism. Some of it is the rise of the internet. So with the press in particular, used to be they'd sell a newspaper. Maybe, you know, they'd sell a few more on the day there was a big headline. But you were selling the whole newspaper and you were mostly getting subscriptions. Now it's negative news, gets clicks, and it's clickbait. And, you know, it ends up playing to the lowest common denominator in a lot of ways. And, you know, that leads to profit, but it also can lead to distrust. You know, how can we trust that this is actually true um, when there's so much of that emphasis on what's going to get the most clicks? That's why we have these fake news sites. But I think that's at the root of, you know, why you have so much more distrust in, in the press. And then that, I think, feeds also that distrust in government and that idea of, like, they're all in it for themselves, which just, I mean, I know we kind of take that for granted these days, but that did not used to be as common a belief as it is now. Yeah, and one of the themes that I mentioned earlier that, you cover is the individualism versus collectivism. And it seems like the individualism has just been on the rise throughout all generations. Has that declined on any generations or has it just been up? Well, it, it depends on which aspect of individualism you're looking at. So if you're thinking about, you know, the cultural emphasis on, say, treating people as individuals regardless of background, that's a pretty good description for a lot of the movements um, for equality. And that has arguably continued, you know, in a pretty linear manner throughout all those generations that we've been discussing. You know, those changes started with the silent generation and have continued in that direction of, you know, we're going to try to look at people and their own wants and desires rather than, you know, bend them into groups and say, oh, you know, you have to do X or Y because you're a member of this group, which is a pretty common belief in the 1950s. You know, yeah. if you were a woman, you needed to stay home with your kids as just one example of, of one of those types of, of beliefs. And then individualism challenged that and said, you know, why does it have to be one size fits all? Why is that to be, you know, that everybody of the one group is going to do something? Um, and that also relates to sexual orientation as another example of same sex marriage is one thing that, um, is much more supported in times and places that are more individualistic. But I think the one piece of individualism that has changed somewhat is the idea of emphasizing people feel, feeling positive about themselves. So that started with boomers and then started to show up in the survey data on what people thought of themselves with Gen X and then continued through millennials. And then we really haven't seen that as much for Gen Z. Um, mm. That's one of the biggest differences between millennials and Gen Z. Uh, millennials, at least you know, as as teens and young adults, much more confident, much more optimistic than Gen Z. Yeah, I, one statistic you had is uh, people going to college in 2012, 78 percent entering college, and this is millennials, uh, believe themselves above average in their drive to achieve, and then 63 percent above average in leadership ability, which is right. mathematically not right. possible for it to be true, right? right? <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. And that's where we see that transition is from, from boomers to Gen Xers to millennials. But then it turns around a little bit, at least in some of the measures for Gen Z, where they're a little less likely to think that they're above average or to have higher self-esteem um, or to have, they have much lower expectations is another piece. So um, in some of the surveys of 18 year olds, they're asked things like, what job do you expect to have when you're 30? You know, how much education do you expect to attain? And those had been on a just huge rise. Many more people thinking they'd have a professional job, that they go to graduate school, et cetera. And then that 
changes and, you know, right around that 2012 time in the transition for that age group between millennials and Gen Z, Gen Z's expectations um, considerably lower than millennials of the same age. I do have a question for you being a part of Gen X to go back to Gen X for a minute. As you studied all of this, is there anything that just surprised you personally because you have that frame of reference being a part of a generation and then you're studying it from a distance in a certain sense? Is there anything that surprised you about your own generation? Well, I mean, that chapter, the Gen X chapter, believe it or not, was actually the hardest to write, even though that's my own generation. Now, you know, the pop culture stuff about the Saturday morning cartoons, that was fun. That was easy, yeah. you know, talking about those things that, that we experienced, you know, as as kids and how so many of the Saturday morning cartoons that we watched seemed to have been written by people who were high. You know, that was interesting. So I had fun mm-hmm. writing about that. But, you know, trying to get a handle on Gen X is difficult um, because we're a smaller generation. You know, we're in between boomers and millennials, two bigger generations. Everybody forgets about us, but we kind of like that. You know, we like flying under the radar. So I think that, you know, that that was the hardest part of that chapter. And then um, some of the, 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 the mental health stuff we discussed about how Gen Xers turned around a lot of those statistics that they were they were struggling with mental health issues as teens and young adults, but then as older adults did relatively well. That was that was surprising to me. I wasn't I don't think I would have predicted that. Yeah, and one thing that is also surprising is Gen X just hasn't had as big a role in government. Mm-hmm. even as they've grown older, that their presence just hasn't been there. Like yeah. boomers still occupy most positions in government yep. in the U.S. Is yep. that right? Yeah, that was, that was one of the first things that I did for this, for this book was to look at the CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, um, to look at senators, governors, and see what the breakdown was by generation and then at the same age. So did the math, figured out, okay, when boomers, you know, were at their kind of median ages, say in their 50s, compared to Gen Xers in their 50s, what did it look like for governorships for the Senate, you know, for for CEOs of companies? Gen Xers are way behind boomers, Mm -hmm. um, even when you take age, you know, out of the equation from where boomers were. Um, at the same ages. And, you know, I think there's there's some factor, one factor there, simple demographics, boomers are a bigger generation, but only by about 15%. Mm. So even with that taken into account, there's still pretty big differences there. And I think a lot of times Gen X just looked at boomers being leaders and were like, not for me. You know, mm. I don't know if I want to do that, particularly in politics. But then I got the idea of like, well, boomers... You know, and and I'm sorry, Gen X has always been interested in business. Maybe it'll show up. Maybe it won't. The thing won't show up with CEOs, but it does. There's still a lot more boomers in those roles compared to Gen Xers at the same age. And I think it's partially because boomers are literally blocking the way that they're a big Mm -hmm. generation who is retiring later. And so even if Gen Xers wanted those positions, there's a lot of boomers who are still in them. Yeah, and, and boomers are getting to that age where I mean, retirement is more and more common. So it seems like there's going to be quite a bit of a change in both government and and leadership in large corporations and companies over the next 10, 15 years. That's probably the case um, because that leading edge of the boomers born in 1946. So. That's that's Trump, for example. He was born in that year. And they're in their late 70s. Yeah. And the biggest tranche of boomers were born in 1957. So a little bit later. And even they're pushing retirement. And so there's there's definitely big changes on the horizon. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch the dynamic play out because it seems like it'll be competition between millennials and and Gen X to see who fills a lot of leadership positions. Gen Z too, but they're a little bit younger. So Mm -hmm. the likelihood is more to go to the Gen X and millennials. Mm -hmm. So 
uh, millennial. I mean, I'm a millennial, so it was interesting reading that. I didn't read your uh, Generation Me book. Uh, the first book I read of yours was iGen, so I didn't get a chance to read that one prior. But a lot of things resonate with me and don't because, like, millennials were uh, the participation trophy generation. That's what a lot of people look at millennials as. That's nothing I ever experienced. I was, I was always in competitive environments in sports. I never once received a participation trophy for anything. But I know younger millennials definitely did. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to my girlfriend, who's a younger millennial, and uh, she says her siblings did, and they're Gen, Gen Z. But that kind of concept of you're special just for being you and what that does is very interesting. If you want to elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, I think that was an outcome of, of individualism. It was this idea, you know, boomers started to explore these ideas about focusing more on the self. And then they had kids and like, oh, we should teach kids that and tell them things like you can be anything you want to be and you're special and believe in yourself and anything is possible. And I think the problem with those statements is they're not just individualistic, they're delusional. That if everybody thinks they're, they're special, what would the world actually be like? Um, believe in yourself is fine, but that you can do anything, not really. So, you know, it takes things a little bit too far. Yeah. And I think that's been the, um, the criticism aimed against boomers as parents is that there were maybe a few too many who put their kids on a pedestal, told them they could do no wrong, that they uh, raised their expectations to a level that couldn't possibly be met. Yeah, I do remember that you can do anything when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. I heard that from teachers, parents. Yep. You can do anything you want to. Yep. And kids in the 50s didn't hear that. It, it is, you know, historically unusual as a, as, as a statement. I was a, a big basketball fan when I was younger. Michael Jordan fan. I was from uh, outside of Chicago. So when somebody's telling me I can do anything I want to do, I want to be Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. I'm five foot nine. I was going to say, uh, yeah, good luck with that, right? Yeah. You know, <laughs> even if yeah. you are, say, a pretty good high school basketball player, you know, it's uh, it, it's a tough goal. Yeah. Um, Michael Jordan is a one in a one in many billion yeah, kind of exactly. athlete, you know. So it is interesting. I mean, people people do have different proclivities and they have different things that they're good at and things that they're come natural to them. I think we just have differences. So it is interesting that my generation was told you can do anything you want to do. You can be anything. And I I mean, I, it's something I've reflected on in my lifetime and talked about with many of my friends. Like, yeah, that was bullcrap that we were told that it's a complete <laughs> lie. So it's like, it's not like, reading your book was the first time I came to that realization. Most millennials, as we've grown up, have faced that. Like, yeah, yeah, we were kind of fed bull crap. Like, mm -hmm. it was all a lie. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think yeah. it's important to keep that in mind, too, that, you know, um, my intention in this book is to try to understand each generation's experience. That, you know, it's not about criticism. It's not deciding whose fault this is or anything like that. That, you know, no matter what we're, we're talking about, finger pointing is not the goal. It's trying to understand that perspective. And I think that's a great perspective that you're, you have right there to, to point out, you know, some of these messages. You know, you, millennials didn't ask to be raised this way. You know, it wasn't that that was their idea. Uh, and then, yeah, you could really argue it did them a disservice because they got older and realized that none of it was true. Yeah. and. Depression, even in adulthood, is a big thing with millennials. Um, yeah. I've had my share of uh, mental health struggles in my life, and um, I feel like a pretty resilient person, but it you know, uh, it was something that I've known a lot of people who have had mental health struggles. I've known people who've taken their lives, and not that suicide wasn't something that happened with previous generations. I mean, you definitely point that out in the book that um, boomers, um, the rate of suicide doubled 
from silence to mm-hmm. boomers. That's right. So it's not like it hasn't been present in previous generations, but it it is palpable with the millennial generation. Yeah, and you know, it's it's a different trajectory from Gen X where they had a lot of struggles as teens and young adults and things got better. For millennials it actually went the other way. As teens and young adults, a lot of mental health statistics are actually improving. So the suicide rate went down for teens between Gen X and millennials. Some measures of depression went down. Not everything. There were some things about yeah, not sleeping well and you know having a hard time thinking clearly, you know, those types of kind of psychosomatic symptoms of depression. Those actually got a little bit worse between Gen X and millennials. But most of the indicators are actually going in a pretty positive direction when they were young. Then yeah. comes adulthood. And so there is a rise, um, particularly among younger millennials, those between the ages, um, at least when we're measuring this, say, you know, the data that we've got um, from I don't know, the late 2010s, for example, that age group of like 25 to 35 year olds um, it has seen an uptick in, in depression that started around 2016 or so. And so it comes later and it's a little smaller than the increase we'll talk about in a little bit with Gen Z. But it is definitely there uh, and deserves mention, along with the other thing that really surprised me in analyzing the stats for millennials was uh, drug overdoses and suicides and what some people call deaths of despair went up between Gen Xers and millennials during adulthood, which is surprising given how much better, you know, millennials are doing a lot of indicators as teens, but then in adulthood, a lot of those things went wrong. Yeah. And I mean, you touched on this in the book of that, those high expectations potentially being one of the big factors in that is we are told we can do anything, we can be anything. And then, you know, we we lived comfortable lives in high school. Not that everyone did. I knew I knew people who had pretty crappy childhoods mm-hmm. too. Absolutely. But in general, our parents focused, put a lot of attention on us mm-hmm. as millennials. Mm-hmm. And then we get to adulthood and you know it the rest of the world didn't job. treat you as special. Yeah. Like yeah. you get a you you end up with in a crap job. You don't have much prospects, uh especially if you didn't go to college and even if you did go to college, like I know people, millennials that, I mean, they regret going to college because mm. by that time, the cost of tuition and books and everything was so inflated, so excessive. Now they have $200,000 of debt hanging over their head and they're trying to get a job and not getting the job that they expect to get right away. I know people who had law degrees and didn't have a job as attorneys for several years after graduating with their degree. And that's, it's common, very common with millennials to get done with her. I mean, most of them are done with college at this point, but they got done with college and then they just did not end up in the positions that they expected to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that, that's definitely the story for, for some segment. Um, but the good news is that median incomes for 25 to 44 year olds are at all time highs, even when adjusted for inflation. Most of that increase is driven by people going who went to college. So you didn't go to college, those incomes are fairly stagnant, but there's been big increases in the number of people who have gone to college. So particularly for millennials, the best educated generation in history up to this point, Many more had a college degree compared to previous generations. And then those median incomes for people with college degrees went up. With that end result, the millennials are actually doing relatively well. So I have a little pushback on that because, or skepticism, because Mm -hmm. I'm very skeptical of government, as many people in my generation and and your generation are. And I, uh, so we have presidents and they're trying to get reelected at least every four years. And Mm -hmm. then we have this thing in our country where there's not a lot of incentive to solve problems. There's more incentive to just pass the problem on to the next person. So you like keep the problem at bay 
And then you say, okay, now somebody else is there. Now they have to deal with it. I have skepticism toward the U.S. Census Bureau's inflation statistics. I think those numbers are likely That's Bureau of Labor Statistics. Okay, okay. Yeah, but you're right. The census data does keep track of the median income, but it's the Bureau of Labor Statistics that is in charge of that inflation adjustment. Even that, I feel like there'd be pressure from administrations to make the numbers look better than they are, and that would carry over from each administration. Is that like a reasonable skepticism? Well, I don't know enough about government hiring, but I think that those folks are pretty disconnected from that. Um, I mean, I think the other thing is that we know from other sources that there's also some good news. So the Federal Reserve, for example, uh, yeah, particularly the St. Louis Fed, looks into wealth building. Mm. And they have concluded that millennial wealth is neck and neck with Gen Xers at the same age and on track to catch up with boomers as well. Even though that when you do a calculation of wealth, that has to take debt into account. But there's been, um, incomes have been high enough um, millennials timing in the housing market was good enough that their wealth building is actually pretty good. And that's, that's from a different source. And I think it, it also, the wealth piece makes sense when you look at what actually happened in the housing market, because there's this very, very strong perception on millennials will never be able to buy houses. When, if you look at a graph of housing prices and that's, Yet another, you know, government agency. So you'd have to have a really big conspiracy is what I'm saying yeah, for yeah, it to be a conspiracy. Yeah. Like it had to involve like hundreds of people probably for all of these stats to be wrong is, would, would be my, my uh, theory. Those housing prices, they were lower after the Great Recession and older millennials, those born in the 1980s, actually faced a pretty good housing market, especially compared to now where housing prices are really, really high and interest rates are high. So younger millennials and Gen Z born in the 90s, they're the ones who are in a really hard position when it comes to houses. Gen Xers who often bought before the Great Recession and then saw the value of their homes plummet were in a tough position. Younger millennials, Gen Z in a tough position. Older millennials actually timed the housing market perfectly if they bought at a typical time, like say in their 30s. Yeah, I, I can attest to that. I bought in my 30s. My house has doubled in value. Mm -hmm. I look at people without homes right now. Right. And I'm like, oh, it's yep. kind of a difficult situation yep. to be in. Yeah, that's right. Because rent is going up. Home prices are going up or they're yeah. coming and down the, a little the, bit. You right got to keep the interest rates in mind too, because there's often yeah. been a ton of focus on, you know, oh, but housing prices went up so much between boomers and millennials. And they did. But people forget that the interest rate for boomers when they were buying in the early 1980s was like 15%, mm, 17% yeah. at its peak. Crazy. And then you think about then in the, two, in the 2010s, how interest rates were 3%, 4 or 5 at most for most of those years. Yeah. And you do the math on that and the mortgage payment ends up just about the same. So the down payment has to be more. So that's where there is more of a challenge yeah. with, with prices going up, even with lower interest rates. So it's not that it's all easy, but if you were lucky enough to buy at that, at that, at that time um, in the, the 2010s, then you're in a pretty good position right now. Yeah, and it's kind of funny because interest rates, as far as I can see, need to be higher right now, but they can't do it. Like there, yeah. I mean, there would be... So many angry people if they try to raise interest rates too much more right now. But to get a handle on inflation, they really do need to. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the hope is that later this year, maybe they'll start to be able to lower interest rates. I think a lot of people would would like that. But yeah, they're trying to balance that. They're trying to balance the interest rate and the rate of inflation. Yeah. One thing that happened during my childhood, I was... 16 or 17 when 9 11 happened. And that I feel like that is a pretty significant point in, uh, at least in the political and uh, worldwide politics and everything, because your generation had privacy. 
And my generation had privacy when we didn't need it when we were younger. Mm -hmm. And we've never had, most of us have never had privacy as adults. And that's something that happened because of 9-11, because of... Don't you, you think know, it happened we, because social media and everybody just voluntarily put their information online? Th that's true, too. Yeah, a lot of it had to do with social media. Um, but there was also the Patriot Act and, you know, that the certain things kind of went out the window when it came to, you know, we had such a big enemy to fight that, you know, privacy wasn't as big of a, it wasn't as sacred for governmental entities. But... Yeah, uh, social media is a big one too. I was 17 or 18, I think, when MySpace first came around. I was around 19 when Facebook came around. I had friends that could, I had friends that were on Facebook and telling me about Facebook before I could get on it because I wasn't going to a college where it was accessible. Mm -hmm. you, you had to go through to certain universities and have a university email. And it was only, you know, around 20 years old when it finally became accessible to everyone. And it's interesting because social media was a millennial thing at first. Mm -hmm. And then five, six, seven years later, maybe 10 years later, now people's grandparents were on social media. That's right. Especially massive, on Facebook. That's thing. why Facebook yeah. fell out of favor with a lot of young people is because grandma was on it. Yeah, it's very interesting because, yeah, who wants to, you can't talk with your friends the same as you can, I mean, at least when you're younger, you can't talk with your friends the same way you have to talk around your grandparents and yep. parents. A very different atmosphere there. Uh, Gen Z, obviously not a part of Gen Z, but it's been very interesting because they're shaping the world in a big way. Trans rights. And just people being trans. When I was in high school, being gay was taboo still. Mm -hmm. Like it was only after I graduated high school where people were more accepting. People used gay as a slur. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I was a young kid being like, hey, these people are calling me this word. I don't know what it means. And my parents had to explain it to me. But after. High school, the atmosphere changed a lot. And in the real world, like millennials were very accepting of gay people mm -hmm. and gay rights and gay marriage and all mm -hmm. that. But transgender wasn't a well-known concept. And now it's common. Now it's well-known and people, a lot more people identify as transgender and Gen Z than any other generation. Mm -hmm. And I believe in your book, you don't come to a conclusion about what the cause of it is mm -hmm. because it's just not completely known. You do elaborate that it's not, it doesn't seem like it's prior generations hiding that they're transgender or not feeling comfortable disclosing it. It's an actual change in how the generation is. Yeah, so there's um, a couple of big surveys that have asked about identifying as trans. Um, one of them started asking that question in 2014. So, you know, it doesn't go back as far as I'd like, but it still gives us a view of the last 10 years or so. And back then, if you looked at just an age breakdown, there wasn't a big link between how old you were and thus your generation and whether you identified as transgender. But then that started to change. Um, transgender identification among young adults uh, quadrupled, and it didn't change that much among the people who were in their late 20s and older. So that suggests there's some sort of generational shift going on, um, particularly with, with Gen Z. Yeah, and there's a lot of, it seems like there's been major changes between prior generations and Gen Z. And maybe that's just because I'm sitting there in between Gen X and Gen Z. And like the slow life strategy, which really happened as well in millennials, but people not getting their driver's license mm -hmm. until, you know, past 18, which is bizarre mm -hmm. to me because, yeah, I mean, even when I was 16, I wanted to get the license mm -hmm. as soon as I could. 
Mm-hmm. And I've known younger people who they didn't have an interest in getting a license right away or drinking alcohol. I mean, I drank alcohol when I was 14, 15 years old and, you know, dating. I wanted to date women when I was very young, you know, 15, 16 years old. And why do you think that is? Like what, I mean, the slow life strategies were were sheltered more, but you would think that kids still want to engage in these activities that we see as potentially fun. Yeah, not as much, not as much. So let me put this in a larger context that we notice this the most with teens, but it really you know affects everybody. That at times and places, when people live longer, when healthcare is better, and when education takes longer to finish, parents tend to have fewer children and nurture them more carefully. And those children take longer to grow up. And older people take longer to grow old. So children are less independent. Teens are less likely to do these adult things. Young adults marry later, have kids later, settle into careers later. Middle-aged people look and feel younger than their parents or grandparents did at the same age. So it's 60 is the new 50, 50 is the new 40, all those types of ideas. So yeah. the whole developmental trajectory has slowed down. And I think it's really helpful to acknowledge that for, for several of these generations. Um, it, so for millennials, for example, there's, you know, been this whole idea of like, oh, you know, millennials are they're taking so long to get married and have kids. Like, what's wrong with them? Well, guess what? This is something that's been going on for a long time and is rooted really strongly in these big cultural trends. It's not just millennials making that decision. Same thing with, with Gen Z that, you know, say Gen Z teens are less likely to have a driver's license or a paid job or drink alcohol or go out on dates, that these are things that adults do and children don't. And so mm-hmm. they are being put off until later because of that development slowing down. And that's not all good or all bad. Um, so tempting to look at these trends and say, oh, but that's good or that's bad. Sure, but what really brings those trends together is that slower development. Yeah, I love that nuance that you bring to everything. Um, millennials were optimistic, Gen Z pessimistic, and that's interesting. Um, they believe that they're, you know, America isn't a fair country, which there is some truth to that, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Like there are, definitely mm-hmm. is some truth to it. Yeah, but there's a big generation gap in that belief, which is interesting. Yeah, um, suicide is a huge, huge problem. Um, Twice as many people committed suicide in 2019 than 12 years prior. What do you, I mean, social media obviously is going to have something to do with that. Uh, Women, uh, young girls, especially with social media like Instagram and things like that, they're constantly comparing themselves and, and women tend to be valued for their looks in society a lot more than men. But what, how do you account for that? Like, what do you put as the primary reasons for that? Yeah. So, you know, this, it, this all started when the data for teens um, started to become available for, you know, around the mid 2010s, I started to see this when I was working on iGen, that red book that you held up at the beginning. This so is starting around 2012 or so, more and more teens started to say they felt lonely, that they felt left out felt like they couldn't do anything right, that their lives weren't useful, that they didn't enjoy life. Clinical level depression started to go up um, among teens, among 12 to 17-year-olds in the U.S. Twice as many were clinically depressed in 2019 versus 2011. And notice Mm. that's before the pandemic, so we can't use the pandemic to explain these because they started good eight years prior. Self, self-harm self went up, suicide went up in these, in these age groups, particularly teens and young adults, and that's the, the Gen Z cohort. So that begs that question. Well, with all these changes happening right around that time, in the early 2010s, you know, around 2012, what happened around that time that could explain that? And when I first started to see these trends, I had no idea. You know, it was a real mystery because the U.S. economy was finally starting to improve at that point. It was clear that wasn't it. Um, it was hard to think of any event that happened at that time and then kept going. 
particularly because we got more and more evidence that these trends were happening around the world. It wasn't just in the U.S. We we're seeing these same trends in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia, among teens, especially around loneliness and anxiety and self-harm as well. So turns out the end of 2012 is the first time the majority of Americans owned a smartphone. It's also around the time that social media use moved from relatively optional to almost mandatory among high school students. Mm -hmm. And the character of social media changed around that time too, that um, Instagram became more popular. Um, more phones had front-facing cameras. So it went from MySpace, which, you know, some people did and some didn't, to something like Instagram, where almost everybody was on one of the platforms, you know, Snapchat or Instagram, were the two most common. And then it was very image based. And that's also probably why those increases in anxiety and depression, for the most part, were larger among girls and young women than among boys and young men. Yeah, there's the social media is, it can be a positive thing. We, we can connect over social media. That it, it can be a very positive thing. But I know you're an advocate for age verification mm -hmm. for for underage people. Maybe they shouldn't be using social media. And I agree with that. But then you also will point out without that, it's kind of hard to do because if, I mean, no kid wants to be the only person without access to something. So you don't want to be the only high school kid without a Instagram or without TikTok or whatever it might be. But you can survive without it. There's plenty of safer ways for kids to communicate with each other. Yeah. My, my own kids are in that age group. They're 17, 14, and 12. So this is my everyday life as well as my research life. Do you keep your kids away from social media as much as possible then? Yes. Do they give you a pushback on it? Um, I've been very lucky. My 17-year-old just is not interested in it. Um, probably not going to get that lucky the next two times. But yeah, my middle one is 14 and, you know, she's really, I think, I, I still think too, too young for those, for those things. So one thing that we've done is the rule in our household is you get your first actual smartphone when you get your driver's license. Mm. So kind of tying that to independence in a way. Uh, and then it also means it's 16. So what they have instead is uh, phones designed for kids. So there's a couple companies yeah. that do that. Trumi, Gab, Pinwheel. And on those phones, you can text and call and take pictures, and that's about it. And there's no capability yeah. for social media um, or general internet access. Yeah, I think that's a good thing. I mean, there's also a lot of... There's predators online, too. And they mm -hmm. get access to children from... Right. There's other like games that can actually be a, a window of access for predators, too. But yeah, and it's just not regulated. I mean, this is the yeah. problem with it is, you know, what other place is it so easy for unknown adults to contact minors? Yeah. And it's pretty easy. And that that's the other scary thing. Uh, the perception of gender discrimination was very interesting because uh, you point out that Gen Z teenagers, teenage women are more likely to believe that gender discrimination is going to be inhibit their ability to excel in their careers and get education degrees, even though women get a higher percentage of degrees than men at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was surprised by that too. And I think it's just a, it's a gap between perception and reality that, you know, I mean, first, just to be clear, we have to acknowledge gender discrimination does absolutely exist. But at least in terms of getting into college and getting a college education, that's one place where there's relative equality. And in fact, it tilts the other direction. Yeah, a higher percentage of uh, people getting a college degree. It's 57% women right now in the U.S. So that's one place where we can dial down on what's that gap. And there's a lot of perception of a lot of disc gender discrimination in that area in, these, in this survey of 18-year-olds. Um, but that's kind of out of step with what the reality is. Yeah, and, and you point out that one potential reason could be 
that just these certain headlines, certain narratives kind of take hold in social media and stuff like that. The things that kind of trend are negative things. And this is true for uh, millennials and their perception too. And many, many people's perception is just yep. we're constantly bombarded with negative information. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that that explains a lot of the stuff that we, that we've been discussing. Um, and some really great studies in social psychology have shown this, that yeah. it's much more likely for social media posts emphasizing the negative and being angry that they spread further. Same thing with, with news. And it's meant that we have these challenges for our society, for our democracy, really, in how we're communicating, how we're getting information, tilting so heavily negative. Yeah, I think that I'm hoping that'll change over time. I I think there are some efforts, like my podcast, for instance, I'm trying to make something more positive. I'll talk about contentious issues, but I don't want to be judgmental. And I want to gain perspective and have other people gain perspective because we benefit from understanding mm -hmm. each other better. And I mean, that's what your work is all Absolutely. about. Absolutely. That's the main goal. When it came to the founding fathers and that question of the founding fathers, do you see them as heroes or mm -hmm. villains? Mm -hmm. uh, three out of four uh, in the study, and this is Gen Z, said they're villains. No, no, no. It was four out of ten. Four out of ten. Okay, okay. Sorry. Four out of ten said but they're villains. That's still quadruple as many as boomers, for example. Yeah, yeah. It was three out of four. Didn't But the unfair society and, unfair, and the government yeah, yeah. needing big changes. Yeah, so... Four out of 10 believe the founding fathers to be villains rather than heroes. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, four times as much as prior generations, you yeah. said? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that was that was interesting because that was negativity, not about the current situation, but about the situation 250 years in the past. One question I wish would have been asked as a follow-up to that is, mm -hmm. okay, who were the heroes then mm -hmm. at the time? And it doesn't seem like that question got, because yeah. it's not a dynamic conversation. So that question right. obviously didn't get asked, right? Yeah. But it would be really interesting because, I mean, most people see the founding fathers as heroes against a tyrannical British mm -hmm. ruler. Mm -hmm. And I think, I would imagine that a lot of the perception is, well, founding fathers... Many were slave owners, and that's why they're villains. I I would yeah. imagine, you know, yeah. they had you know that kind of situation going on, and I mean, it's a big problem when we look at prior generations and in the past, and try to look at it through the lens of the current times. Because I mean, we're doing things now that future generations will look and look at us and be like, why did you believe that? Why yeah. did you act that way? And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we want some, some grace given to our generations. And I think we should try to give that to past generations as well. So we have a uh, declining birth rates. I'm 38. I don't have children. I don't know if I will have children. I know many millennials that don't have children. Gen Z is continuing that trend. It doesn't look like they're going to want children. Part of that has to do with individualism, mm -hmm. caring about our own lives a bit more than collectively raising children and all of that. Uh, that's going to have huge impacts on the country. Now, what do you, what are the biggest impacts you see there? Yeah, well, you know, we can look to countries like Japan that have had lower birth rates for a while to see that, you know, think about social security and how is that going to be able to survive when we have fewer younger workers and more older retired people relying on it because that's what it, it relies on. It relies on there being enough young workers and, you know, cause the money you're paying in is not the same money that you get back. It's, you know, it's a weird system. So, and I mean, just very practical things, 
like we're going to have a lot, uh, you know, people live fairly long and medical care, you know, can prolong lives. But who's going to be doing that work? Who's going to be working in the nursing homes if there's a lot fewer younger people? So there's some really, really practical implications of this um, that are pretty stark. Every generation or most generations, especially the recent generations, has had less and less interest in religion. And uh, you point this out in the book, and this has been a concern of mine for a long time. I've been very worried that while I'm not religious, I do see a tendency, or I think there's a tendency for people to adopt political ideologies or have deference for the state or be more susceptible to deference to the state when they don't have something higher calling to them? Is that pretty accurate? Well, you know, I'm certainly not the first one to suggest this, that politics have replaced religion in a yeah. lot of ways in our, in our current society. Yeah, I mean, and if you look at authoritarian regimes in the past, like communist regimes, that has been an mm -hmm. intentional thing that they've pushed for is the elimination of religion because it does compete with the state. If, mm -hmm. if, you, if you claim to have a god, then the god takes precedence over any mandate that the state can make. So it is interesting in that sense. Um, I didn't realize this, but you pointed out in the book that the popularity of the president in people's formative years in their late teens, early adulthood is likely to influence their future political leaning. Yeah, this is a big, a big study that um, done by some statisticians um, and political scientists that I, I just thought was really interesting in his generational implications that. If you look for each generation and then who was president when they were young and was that president popular or not, that that seems to have an influence across the rest of their lives for their political leanings. So one example of that is Gen Xers were young during the Reagan era, a very popular Republican president. And sure enough, Gen X has tilted more Republican their whole lives. And millennials with Obama, a relatively popular Democratic president, had, they've tilted more liberal. So that's one reason in politics you see often this break between Gen Xers and millennials, two generations which otherwise have a fair amount in common when it mm -hmm. comes to, say, individualism, the slow life strategy, technology. But politically, there's, there's that break. Who knows what's going to happen with Gen Z? Because they have grown up in an era when um, both Trump and Biden have not been particularly popular. So yeah. it's kind of an unknown, you know, where they're going to end up going politically the rest of their lives because they have been in the era of um, unpopular presidents. You point out that politically we're divided and people don't even have the same facts anymore in many situations. And I've been toying with this idea and talking to a few people about it, I think in politics at least, it might be broader than that, but I'll actually adopt narratives, not necessarily facts. So it's what narrative they adopt that determines which facts they'll accept and reject. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, for instance, vaccines, you could look at it as one narrative is Vaccines are safe and effective, and if you deny that, you're an anti-vaxxer. And then another narrative, a more extreme narrative on the other end is vaccines are designed to kill people, you know, or vaccines are, there's just different narratives. When neither side, I mean, especially the more extreme side, nothing is absolutely black and white like that. It's like, well, because there's no vaccines, evidence for those types of statements, right? Yeah, yeah. That's the problem. It's like, yeah, like vaccines can help people, but they're probably the broad application of the vaccines. They're probably not the best way to go because maybe children don't need it as much and older people need it at a higher rate and it, it's more beneficial to them. But when you're, kind of, when you're talking about COVID, that's true. For a lot of other vaccines, yeah. children do need them. Yeah, yeah, true, true. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm specifically talking about COVID. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and like... 2020 election, people will say, I mean, there's people that take the extreme and believe that Trump is still president somehow and right. crazy stuff like that. And then there's Again, people. No evidence. 
Yeah. And then there's people, there's one narrative that the election was completely fair, nothing wrong with it, which there were some problems with the election. I think that's objectively true. Um, and it's just interesting to me that it seems to be narratives that are adhered to rather than specific facts. And then mm-hmm. people take the facts based on the narrative that they've bought. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I think there's a, there's a, it's a little kind of beyond my uh, pay grade, but, you know, lot, lots of folks have, have reflected on that, that, you know, that that is the challenge now um, that, yeah, we're not even agreeing on what the facts yeah. are. Like I had a couple of statements that there's no evidence for that, but a lot of people would disagree with that. Right. And, you know, that I think is one of our biggest challenges is how can we move forward when, you know, we're, we don't even have agreement on basic facts. Yeah. I mean, and some of it, I like the decentralization of information to some degree, but there is the, the challenge with it too, as more news exactly. sources and stuff like right? that. We have more up. access to information, but is all of that information correct? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. You mentioned uh, William Strauss and Neil Howe in your book uh, at least one or two times and how some of their predictions have been wrong. One of the predictions for the, in their book, Fourth Turning, is that there is going to be some major, there's essentially like some major war or, or major event every mm-hmm. roughly 80 years. Yep. And that's about where we're at right now. Mm-hmm. And do you think that is kind of turning out to be true? I know some of their other predictions didn't, but yeah, it seems like we're headed there to some yeah. degree. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think their, their theories are really interesting. I, I think that they did really well up until maybe Gen X and then with millennials, they kind of fell apart. I mean, they said um, millennials were going to be the most civically oriented and communal generation ever, and that did not turn out to be true. Mm. They put Gen Z in the same category, gen- generational type. They put Gen Z in the same generational type as silence. Gen Z is basically 180 degrees from silence. They're completely different. You know, silent generation, married young and had kids young and liked strict gender roles. And Gen Z is pretty much the opposite of that. So I think there were some, some places where it, where it seemed to fall apart. And my theory is it fell apart because of technological change. However, when it comes to the idea of the cycles of big events, there is some truth to that. And it does sure seem like we're living in a moment of extraordinary change right now. You know, some of that was with COVID, but some of it is politically that this is a very unusual time. Um, I think about that a lot when I think about the politics that I grew up with. And sure, there was divisiveness and disagreement, plenty, but the two sides didn't hate each other quite as much. And there wasn't as much disagreement on basic facts. Uh, and when you get that, then you have to think something is going to happen. Um, so I, I think there may certainly be some truth to that particular prediction. I think there already has been some truth to it. Yeah. We didn't touch on polars. And part of that is a big reason is that they're just younger. There's not as much There's data on them. There's not a whole them. lot of data on them, yeah. What advice would you have for people raising polars? Um, make sure that your kids go and play outside with their friends and aren't just on their iPad all the time. So, you know, it's, it, I'm not suggesting at all that we get rid of technology. iPads for younger kids are, are great when you need to cook dinner or take a shower or something like that. And even for a couple hours a day, fine. But there is an increasing number of kids who are just not having that childhood experience of playing outside and getting together with friends because they're inside on those iPads so often. And that is, doesn't bode well. I mean, that's that's a little bit of data that we've got is their parents admit, Mm -hmm. yep, they're not getting as much exercise and rates of childhood obesity are at all time highs. And I think that's one of the big reasons why. Yeah, I would say being able to express your ideas and to another person face to face or a group mm-hmm. of people is a very powerful thing. Yes. And social media can't always give that to you too. Mm-hmm. So I think mm-hmm. it's very important to gain those skills as well. Yeah. Uh Dr. Twenge, it was awesome talking to you today. Uh, before we wrap up, I 
Uh, well, one last thing I want to ask is, mm-hmm. aside from your books, are there any other writers, authors, books that you highly recommend people read? Mm-hmm. Um, so here's a couple. Um, What's Our Problem by Tim Urban is a really good uh, analysis of some of the things we've been talking about in terms of, of politics. I. I, I think he's got a really amazing perspective and scaffolding for how to understand our, our current cultural moment. That That's really cool. Um, and then the other thing is my collaborator, Jonathan Hyde, is coming out with a book called The Anxious Generation. And it explores um, a lot of our, um, a lot of the issues we've been, we've been talking about in terms of um, how childhood and adolescence are fundamentally different from the way that they used to be and how that has a strong link to the increases in anxiety and depression among young people. Awesome. I have to look into Tim Urban. I have read uh, The Coddling of the American Mind by Mm -hmm. Jonathan Hyde. He's somebody Mm -hmm. I would love to talk to one day too. Um, Before we wrap up, I just want to give you a chance to Share any other thoughts you want to share and then tell listeners where they can find your book and anything else that you want to share about yourself. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes I think about the challenges we face with technology that how amazing this time is that we live in in a way that we don't always appreciate and how technology has a lot to do with that, that we do live longer lives with less drudgery. If you consider, um, particularly if you think about your grandparents or great grandparents and what their lives were like. So I think about my grandmother who had eight kids and lived on a dairy farm and how when she started her married life that they didn't have even washing machines like we have now, you know, and thinking about just the enormous number of hours that she spent um, just doing laundry, making food, taking care of her family. And those things are easier now. We have more free time. The question is, how are we going to use that free time? Are we going to use that free time to connect to each other, to learn things, to expand our minds, to strengthen our connections? Or are we going to spend that time on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube? and mindlessly scrolling, scrolling through things. Hopefully not, but it's very, very tempting to do so. It's, it's relaxing to do so. Those billions of dollars have been pour, poured into those platforms to make them as engaging as possible. But I think we all are at that crossroads of trying to make that choice of how to better spend the longer lives and more leisure time that we have been given. So, and then, I'll, and I'll, I'll mention the, um, the other things that you said. So I have a substack called Generation Tech where I put my updates on um, changes over time and eventually more stuff about technology and managing with kids as well. We'll, we'll go there. Uh, and then my website's just my name, genetwangy.com, and it's got everything about speaking engagements and books and research and all of that good stuff. Awesome. I'll put all that in the show notes as well. Dr. Twangy, thank you so much for talking to me today. It was a pleasure speaking Thanks to you. Thanks very much. It's been wonderful. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a five-star review on Spotify and Apple. It goes a long way in helping the podcast grow and reach more listeners. You can also like and subscribe on YouTube. And if you want to support the show, you can go to FractalZoo.net, where I have unique fractal-inspired clothing. Each purchase goes directly toward helping the podcast grow. I'll also leave my Amazon affiliate link in the description. You can click on that before making an Amazon purchase, and a small commission may go to the podcast. I love to connect with my audience, so find me on Twitter, or X, at RTM Podcast. That's A-R-T-I-E-T-M Podcast. Or you can find me on Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for listening today. That's it for this one. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.